Well, good day, everyone. This is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar. Today, I'm going to talk about a, um, patholo a type of pathology uh, that we hear quite a bit about. Uh, we're all very familiar with, and uh, to a, a certain degree, I'm sure we're all uh, familiar with um, some of the treatments, the therapies, morbidity, and mortality. And I've actually gotten a, a few questions about this um, this type of pathology, and uh, I've almost uh, I'm almost dreading having to uh, discuss this because it is, at least I find, really difficult to discuss. And uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is um, something known as ARDS. Uh, ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll uh, first talk about ARDS uh, historically, and then I'll talk about some of the uh, pathophysiology and the features of it, and then finally discuss the treatment of ARDS, or Acute uh, Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, as far as I can tell, um, had been um, identified in uh, World War II on um, the, the casualties, the battlefield ca casualties during World War II, a, a very large uh, fraction of them uh, developed this condition. Um, and at that point in time, I believe uh, the terminology for ARDS was uh, shock lung because uh, they, they found, this, the, the battlefield surgeons and physicians found that um, casualties that, that had um, presented in, in, a certain, in a certain type of shock, you know, it could have been an early compensated, a decompensated shock, or what, you know, what have you, uh, but the casualties that, that were in a shock state, more than likely hypovolemic uh, from blood loss, um, had this tendency to develop this... Um, this syndrome or this constellation of uh, signs and symptoms, um, and it was very consistent from patient to patient that developed this this condition. They call it shock lung. Um, and then I believe in the late 1960s, uh, during the Vietnam conflict, um, uh, it, the disease this this process was was formally recognized as acute respiratory distress syndrome. And um, from there, uh, in the uh, late 80s to early 90s, there were several uh, land-breaking, um, groundbreaking uh, papers that came out talking about how we can maybe um, improve morbidity and mortality in ARDS by limiting um, a certain pressure, pressure known as a plateau pressure, if we could keep it under about 30 to 35, we may be able to decrease the, the uh, prevalence of morbidity and mortality associated with ARDS. And um, now that currently brings us into you know 2012 and uh, kind of where we're at. Um, so let's talk about ARDS. I think the first important thing that we need to recognize about ARDS is ARDS is not a... Um, ARDS is not a conventional disease, if you will. It is not, there's, there's not some ARDS virus out there, there's not some ARDS bacteria out there, and really ARDS is not a disease process by itself. ARDS is the, is a severe manifestation of some underlying pathophysiology, so we need to really recognize that ARDS is caused by some under some type of underlying pathophysiology, and we'll talk about some of the the contributing factors and causes here in a little bit. Okay, so something happens to the body, and uh, whatever that is, can go on to develop into ARDS. ARDS is a is a very severe complication of that. So that's the first big thing that I want to get out of the way. Um, the second big thing well, to talk about the pathophysiology. The pathophysiology is is rather complex. Um, and it's still, there, there's, there are a lot of the pathways that aren't very well understood. Um, but, but what we have is um, the major features is we, we have a massive atelectasis of the alveoli. Um, I have damage to the um, type 2 alveolar pneumocytes. And I have a loss of um, surfactant um, producing, producing ability. I have a surfactant dysfunction. Um, I end up developing, um, as the alveoli be, are becoming destroyed, um, this membrane develops on the inside of the alveoli called a, um, an, a hyaline membrane, and this at one point was called hyaline membrane disease, 
and uh, still sometimes kids, uh, babies that develop um, are basically ARDS. They call it IRDS or Infant Respiratory Distress Syndrome, but it's it's very very similar to ARDS. Um, before the the term IRDS, there was this hyaline membrane disease, but it's the the same pathogenesis occurring there. Um, I have uh, massive alveolar consolidation. And we see that on the X-ray too. Uh, everybody knows the quote unquote ground glass, bilateral ground glass appearance, bilateral uh, fluffy infiltrates on the x-ray and so on. And then we have interstitial and intraalveolar edema and hemorrhaging that occurs. Um, and collectively, when all this stuff occurs, what does it do? Well, the big thing that it does is it produces severe uh, refractory hypoxemia and hypoxia eventually. Uh, so I become... I, I develop refractory hypoxemia, which then, of course, progresses into refractory hypoxia. Hypoxemia uh, being low oxygen in the blood, hypoxia being an actual deficiency of oxygen uh, delivery uh, to the distal tissue beds. Okay, uh, so that's the basic pathogenesis of it. Um, what causes are... Uh, I should say that ARDS, before I go into the cause, I should say that, the, that ARDS has... It has different phases, and it it has three distinct uh, three distinct phases that that I kind of want to discuss in in a little bit of detail. And uh, the the three phases, and I may get the terminology a little wrong, but uh, the first phase is known as the latent phase, and this is fairly soon after whatever insult is causing the ARDS. You know, within several hours to maybe even a day or so. And um, during this phase, I have um, um, I have endothelial changes occurring, the, the endothelium of the, the, the alveolar capillary network, and some, maybe some, some inflammatory changes occurring in the alveoli, but by, by and large, the patient is, is more or less asymptomatic. Okay? They don't have uh, symptoms, they may be a little anxious, they may have a little bit of dyspnea, uh, but their vital signs are, are unremarkable, except for whatever underlying, you know, obviously they're hypovolemic or what have you, you know, their, their vital signs may uh, and their physical exam may, may represent that, um, but there there are no indications of um, underlying pulmonary issues um, other than what uh, what uh, other uh, issues already exist. Um, the patient typically is not hypoxemic, nor are they hypoxic, um, and they're more or less asymptomatic. And then, uh, you know, over a day or so, we progress into um, this, this secondary phase where I start developing interstitial edema, where I have a, I now have um, uh, the changes have now, uh, are now fully developing in the um, endovascular um, tissue. The blood vessels uh, are becoming uh, leaky. Their permeability has increased. Fluid is leaking out of the um, capillary network and it is spilling out into the interstitial space. The interstitial space is filling with fluid. Now is this fluid necessary in the, necessarily in the alveoli? No it's not. It's in the interstitial space. So um, typically what I have is I have a patient that has that is symptomatic. They have um, symptoms. They're generally anxious. They, they generally have a sense of something is not right but they can't really describe what's right. Um, they feel dysthmic, like they can't catch their breath. They're tachypnic, um, and um, you know, they may or may not have some pain. Now, when you do a physical assessment, um, it is, aside from their symptomology, these physical exam may be, uh, may be unremarkable for the most part. You'll listen to their lungs, and look, um, I have lung uh, fluid filling my interstitial space, but I don't necessarily have fluid um, in the alveoli themselves, so I may listen to the lungs. I may not appreciate adventitious breath sounds, uh, particularly um, the uh, the crackles that we associate with the pulmonary edema of ARDS. And then finally, we develop into the full washout phase, where I have full-on pulmonary edema. I have that that fluid spilling out into the um, the alveoli. The alveoli are inflamed. They're, they're um, injured, uh, the cells, the type 1, type 2 alveolar pneumocytes are dying, um, I have a hyaline membrane being developed, I have a con consolidation, massive atelectasis, and I have um, massive, uh, or I have refractory hypoxemia. Okay, so those are the three phases. So you can see that uh, 
R does not typically a sudden onset thing. Okay, it generally takes several hours, even days, for ARDS to really develop. Now, there are early signs and symptoms, but we often tend to miss them, or we can tend to miss them as, oh, the patient's anxious, or oh, that they're having some pain, or I don't really know what's going on with them, and we don't recognize the early stages or phases of ARDS um, are not associated with refractory hypoxemia and the classic signs and symptoms that we typically associate with ARDS. So that's a good uh, thing to consider. Okay, um, so what are some of the causes of precipitating factors? A whole laundry list of things. Uh, aspiration, hypovolemia, drug overdose, oxygen toxicity, uh, prolonged ischemia, um, systemic inflama inflammation, inhalation injuries, uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, DIC, uh, major surgery, long bone fractures, major trauma, central nervous system injuries, uh, nervous system surgeries, um, thoracic and non-thoracic trauma, just a whole laundry list. Anything, basically anything that can cause inflammation can lead to ARDS, and it's not well understood why uh, sometimes I have a systemic reaction. Okay, so ARDS, morbidity and mortality of ARDS is still pretty high. Um, some sources say in up to 50% of patients with ARDS will die because, you know, the body doesn't tolerate prolonged hy hypoxemia very well. There are lots of organs that are very sensitive, such as uh, kidneys, the heart, the brain, um, and so on and so forth. And ARDS can, is commonly, can lead to multi-system organ dysfunction, uh, SIRS and multi-system organ failure, and that's what kills a lot of a lot of patients. Okay, so how do we treat ARDS? Well, the first thing we need to recognize is that uh, we need to aggressively find the underlying cause of the ARDS and aggressively treat that cause, be it an infection or an injury or what have you. So that's the first thing we need to identify and aggressively treat or take actions against the underlying cause. Um, how do we treat the oxygenation ventilation status? Well, there are lots of different things, um, and so far most of the data seems to indicate that the, the, the big thing that may decrease morbidity and mortality is uh, limiting the uh, pressure, in, in the, specifically the pressure in the alveoli, um, so I don't uh, exacerbate the inflammatory response that's already occurring. And, um, uh, so far, most people would agree that uh, really the only thing that makes a considerable or makes a notable impact is um, low tidal volume ventilation, or what we call lung protective strategy. Tidal volumes are very low, anywhere from 5 to 7, 6 to 8 milliliters per kilogram. Um, of course, we may have to go higher on the respiratory rate. Um, we may have to um, add a lot of PEEP as well to increase oxygenation. And in some cases, um, we may have to rob Peter to pay Paul, if you will, and we may have to allow our patients to become hypercapnic. We may have to compromise ventilation at the cost of um, optimizing oxygenation with low tidal volumes, PEEP, um, um, maybe increasing the FiO2 and, and, and so on. So uh, our patients may be hypercapnic, their pHs may be a little on the low side, and um, we, we sometimes do that. And then there are also exotic uh, modes of ventilation such as high frequency oscillatory ventilation, high frequency jet ventilation, airway pressure release ventilation, bi-level uh, ventilation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, some providers may uh, transition to pressure, uh, conventional pressure control ventilation um, as well. All of these are uh, considerations. Okay guys, so I think I'm going to cut it off here. I think I've done a, at least a good basic overview um, to ARDS. I, I should say that ARDS is a non-cardiac pulmonary edema, um, and sometimes they will put in a pulmonary artery catheter, uh, assess the uh, pulmonary artery wedge or occlusive pressure, and make sure that it's generally below 18 um, to rule out left ventricular problems. So, but our, the pulmonary edema of ours is non-cardiogenic um, in nature. It is due to the um, microvascular and um, um, intrapulmonary um, inflammatory changes occurring. Okay, guys, as always, thanks for hanging in there.